Hello everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Wade Bradford, and today I want to talk to you about a movie that features that, um, that interesting contraption up there, that at-at. Uh, I'm talking to you about The Empire Strikes Back, and I want to tell you that The Empire Strikes Back is the worst Star Wars movie experience that I have ever undergone. Now, before you get too angry at me, I'm not going to be telling you that The Empire Strikes Back is a bad movie. I think it's an excellent film. I love all of the Star Wars movies. I love the originals, I love the prequels, and I love the sequels. I'm not going to argue that The Empire Strikes Back is the, uh, the lesser of all of those films, but what I'm going to tell you is that The Empire Strikes Back, um, when I first viewed it, which was back in 1980, so I was nine years old, and when I first viewed The Empire Strikes Back, I was disappointed in many ways and a little bit traumatized. So, um, before we get too deep into this, if you are interested, I posted a video about my experience with the first Star Wars movie, Star Wars A New Hope, and if you want to find out my comments about Episode Four, you can click it here if I am successful in doing that, and if not, then I will put it down below in the comments. But let's get to The Empire Strikes Back. So when I was talking about Star Wars A New Hope, Episode 4, whatever you want to call it, I was explaining how this movie meant so much to me when I first saw it, when I was only six or seven years old, and then it meant even more to me when action figures came out, when the re-releases came out, and when the comic books came out. So at this point, uh, when it's around 1979, there had been rumors circulating through the playgrounds and through the classrooms and through the lunchroom cafeterias. All through uh, my elementary school days, we had talked about whether or not there was going to be another Star Wars movie. And this, of course, is well before the internet, and since we were young children, we didn't have access to variety, so we just would hear sort of little rumors. So every once in a while, maybe on the school bus, someone would say, Dude, there's going to be a new Star Wars movie coming out. But we didn't know if it was true or not. There were a few things that were happening uh, during during like 1978, 1979, and that was there was a lot of Star Wars comics through Marvel, so I enjoyed reading Star Wars comics. There was also a novel called Splinter in the Mind's Eye, which had a really cool cover with Darth Vader and Luke and Leia. And these things, the comic books, the, the, uh, the novel, uh, they seem to play upon the romantic tension between Luke and Leia. So many of us often talked about, like, who's, who's Leia going to wind up with? Is it going to be Han or is it going to be Luke? And most of us thought that, that Luke and Leia belonged together. So that um, didn't turn out the way we thought it would. I have to admit that I was on Team Luke during the late 1970s. So um, I lost that bet. I still remember my first impressions for the movie trailer for Empire, and I remember freaking out in a positive way about seeing any of the the snow speeders, the I didn't know they were called at ats, but uh, you know, big four-legged robot dogs tromping through the snow. Uh, I remember that seemed very exciting. I also remember that there was an image of of Luke kind of sitting in a big tube, but this was in the in the depths of Cloud City, I didn't know at the time. So he's sitting in a, in a big tube, and and the floor gives out, and, and he falls down, or it opens up, and he, he, he drops down. It's like, wow, what's, what's going on there? What's happening? And I also, and this might be a false memory, um, but I seem to remember that in the original movie trailers for Empire, that there was a a sort of a floating Darth Vader head uh, and you heard like Darth Vader's mask so it was kind of shown in the background I thought it was like against you know the blackness of space or stars or something like that and so if if I'm remembering it correctly 
that image was probably just meant to show like Vader's in the background and it's scary and you know that sort of thing but um uh, what I thought when I was a kid was that that it, instead the Death Star had been destroyed, so Darth Vader was working on a new space station, and I thought that he was so vain that he made a new space station in the shape of his head, and that Luke was going to Luke and Han and Leia, and they were going to have to sneak aboard the Darth Vader shaped space station. So that could have been a pretty cool story but they decided not to go with that and that's understandable and also they had um new action figures coming out and they made a very big deal about this um sort of secret action figure that you could only get if you gosh i think you had to mail away for it um or you had to collect other action figures to get this action figure anyway i got that action figure here he is if you can see him this is this is the action figure that I got. His name is Bosk. So it starts out with Star Wars, bah, you know, the title goes, and then the crawl goes. I did like the first things that we saw at, in the beginning of Empire, and that is we see, we see new droids. Like many other kids, I've always loved the droid characters. I love this gunk droid. We called him Power Droid back then. Uh, and of course, R2-D2 was one of my favorites. So I was really excited to see to see new droids and and the the droid that's kind of flying and fremnus to fresna fremna fris right i was really excited to see that droid and then what happens well very early in that movie that new droid gets blown up by han solo so you know it was a cool explosion but it's like i wanted to get to know that droid and he got blown up i did love the ice planet a, a great deal uh eventually i sort of wondered why they called it hoth because the first three letters spell the word hot and it was on an ice planet. So I didn't understand that. I wish that they would have done like a callback to that in episode three and called Mustafar, the lava planet, call it Kolth, would have been great, but they decided not to. Anyway, so the ice planet, pretty cool, literally. So then I'm, as a kid, I'm getting, I'm getting back into it. It's like, all right, we get to see Luke and Han and they're working together. And I'm thinking, I can't wait. This movie's gonna be so awesome because Han and, and Luke are back together again. I get to watch, you know, a two to two and a half hour movie with my best friends, Han and Luke, always together in the film, but they get separated quite a lot in that. I'll get back to that later. The other thing that happens in this movie is that uh, Luke uh, meets what I was hope, hoping going to be a, a new friend. Now keep in mind that I'm a nine-year-old boy and I love creatures and monsters and things like that. So when there's the, the Wampa, which looked to me a lot like the, um, the Yeti from the Matterhorn ride in Disneyland, when, uh, when Luke is captured, I'm thinking like, hey, maybe he's going to make friends with this guy. And he does not. Uh, and when he cuts off the Wampa's arm, I can't help feeling sorry for the Wampa. And even Mark Hamill feels sorry for the Wampa. So when the Wampa arm gets cut off, it falls down in kind of a weird sort of slow motion, sort of overdramatic way. And uh, I remember as a kid uh, thinking, well, that's stylistically different. I was very sad when Han Solo's Tauntaun dies. Uh, when the Tondon just falls over because it's so so exhausted from from traveling across this frozen wasteland and just falls over as a kid i was watching it going like well maybe maybe he's not dead maybe the Tonton's just asleep you know or the Tonton fainted maybe the Tonton's just unconscious so the Tonton's going to be okay so i was hoping the Tonton was going to be okay until han solo in his cool winter jacket uses a lightsaber to uh cut open the Tauntaun and we see something that looks a little bit like a combination of apple pie and Chef Boyardee ravioli comes spilling out and as a kid I have to admit I love that scene I love that scene but I was sad I was still sad that the Tauntaun died so we've had two wonderful creatures die we've had a cool droid that shows up and all, all, the, all the cool th new things are getting blown up or killed or their guts are spilling out so it's like come on stop killing things and speaking of killing things, I still remember this when I was a kid watching Empire Strikes Back for the, for the first time. Luke Skywalker, uh, when they when they're being attacked by the At-Ats, the At-Ats up there, 
Luke Skywalker hops into his snowspeeder. Really cool new vehicle. I was really excited to see that. And uh, the snowspeeder has the person that sits in the back that fires the cable. And there is a new character that we meet. And it's a, it's a young guy named Dax who kind of looks a little bit like Mark Hamill. Uh, like they could be cousins or something like that. And so, uh, so Dax jumps in the back and he says, like, he said, he says something along the lines of, wow, I feel like I could take on the entire empire all by myself. And Luke's like, I know how you feel. It's like, wow, Luke's made a new friend and they're going to go and fight adventures together. I, I wonder if Dax is going to get along with Han Solo. Maybe Dax will fall in love with Princess Leia too. Well, that doesn't happen because Dax gets shot you know, and electrocuted and the explosions and so he's he's dead or or he's just knocked out and then he gets squished by the at at uh so that was another bummer it's like i just got to know that character i know all these things are good storytelling because they get you involved and then and then you get excited and then things don't go the way they want to because movies and stories need to have conflict but as a nine-year-old boy i'm 20 minutes in and i'm depressed so the at at battle now that battle is awesome especially when the cables are going around the legs uh that's that's great stuff and sort of painstaking stop motion animation uh so that's great and uh i remember feeling like yeah i love i love this battle i uh, i love what's going on i can't wait to buy these new toys and things like that uh but one of the things that i was excited about was that uh after after they uh, leave the planet Hoth, uh, they're flying off together. So the Millennium Falcon has taken off, and Luke is taking off as well in his X-Wing. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, thank goodness, they're, they're finally all back together. We've got C-3PO and R2-D2, we've got Leia and Han and Chewie and Luke. Am I forgetting anybody? The, the gang's all here. And then all of a sudden, whoosh! Luke goes off. He's going to go to Dagobah because a little tiny ghost in the snow told him to go there. And nobody told him that it was probably a hallucination or something like that. He shouldn't, he shouldn't listen to, to hypothermia dreams. So he goes off to Dagobah and, and, and the rest of them go off on the Millennium Falcon. And I'm like, but I want them to stay together. I, I don't want them to be separated. So uh, I'm hoping that this separation is going to be uh, very quick. So they split up, and, and then two things happen, two plots occur. Plot number one is that Luke uh, meets up with a little green Muppet uh, who is very surly, and he, Luke just wants to find out where Master Yoda, the incredible Jedi, is. And this Muppet just, just talks trash to him and and he hits R2-D2 with a stick uh, and steals his, Luke's food. And so I'm watching this going like, yeah, Luke, you, you killed other creatures. Kill this little green dude. There is no try? That really messes up a nine-year-old boy who's been trying hard and then finds out that, that there is no try. The other plot that's going on is basically asteroids. The video game asteroids. That's what's happening in the other corner of the galaxy, Han and Leia are playing Asteroids. Asteroids came out in 1979, and Empire came out not that long after. Now, for all I know, the Empire script and the production was probably in full swing, and they had no idea uh, about the video game Asteroids. But when I was watching the movie, I was like, oh, Asteroids. And perhaps it's no coincidence that uh, after the asteroid sequence, a big, giant chomping thing comes out to try to chomp the Millennium Falcon. And the day after Empire Strikes Back was released, what came out? Pac-Man. Another big, chompy thing. The other thing about the asteroid sequence is that all this time, Han Solo's putting moves on Leia, and I'm like, hey, back off. That's Luke's girl. All right, so when we go back to Dagobah, uh, I'm finally kind of getting warmed up to this little green hillbilly guy. So they do a whole bunch of training in the swamp, and uh, then something happens. I think that Luke eats a mushroom and then has this really bad trip. So that always freaked me out as a kid. I was like, what's what's going on with, with is Darth Vader 
A clone of Luke Skywalker? We finally get to meet Boba Fett, and I, I, here's the thing. Based upon the bed sheets that I was given as a child, before, well before the movie came out, my Empire Strikes Back bed sheets had Darth Vader and Boba Fett. They were standing side by side, and Darth Vader's like, got his fist up and Boba Fett's got this cool weird looking weapon and they're like wow they're they're gonna be best friends evil friends but best friends best villains that's what they're gonna be I was expecting some bonding to happen between Darth Vader and Boba Fett and the best we get is like you know, no disintegration this time and then we see Boba Fett in his little ship and he shows up on Cloud City and but we we never really get to know Boba Fett very well and it's a really cool costume and a cool action figure, which I don't have anymore. But um, uh, he definitely was my favorite, had my favorite aesthetic. But we don't know him that much. That's why I'm glad there's the Mandalorian, because it's pretty cool seeing that character. What else? Oh, now that we're on Cloud City. Okay, so as a kid on Cloud City, I'm watching the movie, and I'm like, how is the city floating? What's going on with that city? And I was thinking, you know what's going to happen? Something's going to happen to shut the power off, and that city's going to plummet. So I was just waiting for that moment in the movie. It's like, oh, man, they're going to shut off, kind of like shutting off the tractor beam, like somebody's going to flip the wrong switch, and poof, Cloud City's going to fall, and Luke's going to have to save them or something like that. And no, the city just floats, and it's always fine. And in all the other movies, they never worry about Cloud City again. So I was like, oh, okay. I guess it just is a floating city and there's no no problems related to that. It kind of reminded me of the Jetsons a lot. One of the most frustrating parts in the film happens on Cloud City, and it's when Lando betrays them. Okay, that's a cool plot twist, or maybe I should have seen it coming, as, but as a nine-year-old, I was very trusting. So Lando betrays them, the doors open up, and we see Darth Vader in this, this big sort of dining hall, this banquet hall that they've the Empire has rented, because it's, it's just Vader and... And so when Han Solo sees Vader, he takes his blaster and he boom, 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 and he fires. And I'm like, all right, all right, Vader, let's see you handle a laser being shot at you. And he does. He just, he literally handles it. It, it just bounces off of his hand. And I, as a kid, I was like, well, come on. He's too, he's too powerful. So that was frustrating because Han, I really loved Han Solo and, and, and I just felt that he was emasculated in that in that scene. And then then we don't find out what happens directly next. They just kind of walk in through the doors. The, the doors close. And we don't get to see what is probably science fiction's most awkward dinner. I want to know what they ate at the banquet. Because Darth Vader's like, hey, come on in. So what do they, do they talk about? Cloud City's weather? I, do, I don't know. And did Darth Vader, like, sense, like, hmm, Leia, she seems familiar to me. And it's like, I, I, don't, I don't know. We'll, ne we'll never know now. Unless there's a deleted scene out there somewhere. So the movie becomes very exciting when Han Solo is frozen. That scene was very dramatic and traumatic for me. Uh, but I was watching it knowing that Han Solo is going to be saved. So he comes up frozen in carbonite. And then they start to take him away. And then Luke starts to follow. So I'm like, all right, the gang's going to get back together. And Luke's going to kill Boba Fett. And then he's going to knock Darth Vader off Cloud City. And they're going to be reunited. And they're going to thaw out Han Solo. So as, as that doesn't happen, I'm, I'm getting more and more worried. And then when there's the big lightsaber face-off, this is a great, wonderfully filmed sequence, right? That's an awesome lightsaber battle. So I, I like a lot of moments. Uh, I did feel, again, going back to Vader being too powerful, which I guess is the point, but as a nine-year-old, I was like, that's no fair. When, when Vader just starts using his force powers to throw everything at Luke and looks like, ugh, 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 getting all tired, I was like, oh, I'm so mad at Vader, I'm so angry. Okay, so then we get to the big reveal that Darth Vader is Luke's father. And uh, that, that freaked me out. But I also acknowledge that that was a pretty good plot twist. 
that might be the best plot twist in cinema history. But at the same time, here's the thing. I, as a kid, loved Obi-Wan Kenobi. Much more than I did it with, than, than Yoda at first. So I thought Obi-Wan Kenobi was awesome. A and then when Darth Vader says this, that made me realize all of a sudden, Obi-Wan Kenobi is a filthy liar. He's just terribly dishonest because he, he, he says that Luke's father was, was killed by Darth Vader. So I was like trying to rep, like, why... Why did he lie? And I know they try to explain that in uh, in Return of the Jedi about, you know, different points of view. But no, no, that was you were full on lying, Ben. And let's not forget that I was very traumatized that Luke lost his hand. Uh, that was that was highly disturbing to me. I couldn't believe that he lost his hand. I suppose it's poetic justice that Luke gets his hand cut off because he did cut off the 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 arm of that Wampa. So it, it sort of comes full circle. It's karma really. Uh, I was disturbed by it. I didn't want one of my heroes to be maimed in such a way. When Luke jumps, when he jumps into the sort of the big abyss of Cloud City, as a kid, I kept going back and forth as to how Luke survives that fall. And I still don't really know uh, how I am meant to interpret it to this day. So Luke's falling and he probably should die. Uh, because even if he gets sucked into a tube and, and slides a little bit, he it, it just seems it seems like he breaks something at least. So as a kid, I thought one of two things. I thought, oh, uh, the force sort of magically guides him there, and basically I equated the force with just luck, right? So this lucky force, this lucky charm called the force. Uh, just you know helps him out and then the other thing i thought well like well it's just happenstance that the that the garbage tube opens up and, and sucks him in and that it's it's really kind of hokey that he survives i felt like nope he shouldn't he shouldn't have survived that fall but of course now i've learned um having watched all nine episodes of star wars falls rarely kill you palpatine falls into the great electrical pit uh, of the Death Star, and he survived, so I guess it makes sense that Luke survives. I have a pet theory that Han Solo survives his fall as well. I know he gets skewered by Kylo Ren's lightsaber uh, and then falls supposedly to his death, but you know how it's like he falls in something that's very sort of white and glowing, and my theory is that that's a giant Bacta tank at the bottom, and he falls in and gets healed, and then maybe goes down a, a back to tank river to some escape pod or something like that, and that's why he shows up in um, he shows up in the last movie. They make it look like it's um, you know that it's just sort of a memory, but I think that's really Han Solo, and that he teleports there, and uh, Kylo Ren kind of looks away, and when he looks back, uh, Han Solo is teleported away hopefully to film the next Indiana Jones movie. Then we get to the part where R2-D2 saves the day. I think that's great. I love R2-D2, so I'm glad he's responsible, I think, for fixing the Millennium Falcon. And then we get to, uh, we see that, that Luke has been rescued and he's got this new robot hand. It's like, okay, that's that's pretty cool. So Luke's got his robot hand. Uh, Leia is, is hanging out with him. So there it's like, oh, what's gonna happen to them? Uh, and we've got the droids are back together, and we've got this new guy, Lando, who is, he was a bad guy, we, we thought he was a good guy, and then he became a bad guy, but now he's a good guy again, so, so I kind of like Lando, I'm interested in what's going on, and we got Chewbacca. So, they're together, uh, kind of on the, in the same space armada, but, uh, Lando lets us know, it's like, hey, we're gonna find, we're gonna go and we're gonna find Han Solo. So, at this point, when I was watching Empire Strikes Back for the first time, I was nine years old, and to me, because I was so excited throughout the whole thing, I thought like, wow, we're probably about halfway through this film. So it's like, we've probably been, this has been what, maybe like 45, 50 minutes. Now it's going to get good. Now we're, they're going to go and they're going to find Han Solo and there'll be one more big space battle and they will rescue Han Solo. And then maybe Leia will finally decide between Luke and Han and that'll be the end. And it wasn't. They just, 
they just take the Millennium Falcon. They they just go off in, into space, and Luke and Leia are just watching, and then and then the credits roll, and I was like, what the hell? What? They can't be over. I ha- how long do I have to wait until I find out what happens to Han Solo? Three years. So, if 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 you were born later, say in the two thousands, and you like Star Wars, you can watch all the Star Wars. You can watch the original, and you can watch Empire. You can put Empire Strikes Back in your I don't know if you use DVD players. You'll watch it on Disney Plus or whatever. And when you get done with it, you're like, wow, I can't wait to see what happens. And you hit play and you you binge watch the whole thing. But it was. It was different back then. It was it was very hard as a child buying buying action figures of Han Solo and and not knowing not knowing how to play with Han Solo. For the most part, when I played with my action figures, I would take my Han Solo figure and I would put him in my parents' ashtray and I would lay him down in the ashtray. I would fill the ashtray up with water. And then I would put him in the freezer and I would, I would let him stay in the freezer while I played with the rest of the action figures. So, so you can see now, I hope you understand why the empire strikes back. Although a magnificent film is still the worst film to watch. And it certainly was for me. I would love to know what empire strikes back was like for you. So please leave a comment, or if you've got another video, uh, leave us a link to your video if you uh, rant about The Empire Strikes Back or any of the Star Wars movies. I'd love to find out your thoughts. So that's it for today. Thanks for listening to me. Bye.